So let's bring this all the way back uh, to sort of where we were, talking about some of the newer agents against the resistant pseudomonas drugs. Um, is there a clinical rationale for starting therapy with a cephalosporin beta-lactamase inhibitor combination right away? Absolutely. Okay, and what I mean, would that clearly, be? clearly, it's patients who, you give the patient what antibiotic is most likely to work in that patient. And so if you have a patient who is critically ill or unstable, or even a patient who's borderline, and you know they have a history that's of an organism that's resistant to everything else, it's foolish to not give them an antibiotic that's gonna be active against that pathogen. I think that's the very nature of what antimicrobial stewardship should be, is identifying those patients and getting them on therapy first. Kill them, kill them fast, kill them a lot, and get the hell out of Dodge. Well, well, kind of. Uh, again, the, it's it's the right patient, and and so you need to know what I mean. You've heard that over and over again sure. from all of us. Is that there are patients that we there there are patients that, for example, Marin talked about that alerting system that comes up. So if he gets an alert that says I just came to his unit had an XDR pseudomonas the last time he was here, he should absolutely put that patient on Empiric Zerbaxa. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about this. Let's go down to the nuts and bolts just briefly before we go. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about Zerbaxa first. Uh, when do you choose Zerbaxa? How do you dose it? Uh, and does it change based on what you're using the Zerbaxa for? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer that. I mean, we talked a little bit about when you would choose it, and it's particular when you're at concern for drug-resistant pseudomonas. I mean, okay. I think this is an absolute anti-pseudomonal drug. Um, Andy talked about this a little bit. The labeled dose is, is one and a half grams every eight hours. Um, I've actually personally never used that dose because that is the dose for complicated urinary tract infections and complicated intra-abdominal infections. And when I have an XDR pseudomonas, it's causing pneumonia, it's causing invasive infection in a critically ill patient. And so they're studying the drug right now in the nosocomial pneumonia study at three grams every eight hours, uh, based partially on ELF penetration with the drug, but also we know that in critically ill patient, pharmacokinetics go out the window, right? I mean, you can see any type of kinetic exposure, and the three gram dose has been proven to be pretty safe. So I will tell you that I've never not given this drug three grams every eight hours for a patient okay. from the standpoint, unless they have renal insufficiency that requires a dose reduction, but it's the three gram base that I'm starting with. Yeah, and I was just gonna echo that point about underlying renal dysfunction, since many of our patients do have, I mean, it, it seems like they run into two categories. The majority of them, at least in our medical ICU, tend to have some renal dysfunction, but then we also get in our trauma unit and some of our transplant patients, patients who have augmented renal function. And it becomes even more important in those patients, as you said, to give them that higher dose or the appropriate dose of the drug. And, and extend the, act, the activity by giving long infusions okay. as well. Yeah. Can, uh, forgive my ignorance, can you dose this drug by level? I wish. I, I mean, wish, if, you, huh? if you happen to, I mean, it's a beta-lactam therapeutic drug monitoring is in vogue. It's, uh, people are interested in it because we're learning, particularly in ICU patients, that again, Andy and I could have 50-fold different concentrations and exposure with the same dose. And so we want to get there. We are not there at this point in right. time. So let's move on to Avacaz. Uh, again, uh, how do you dose that? Are you using it for the same indications? What do you do? Well, um, Avicaz, um, Avi, well, Avicaz is a um, is a potent drug against enteric bacteria, including those uh, carbapenemase producers. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, in those hospitals that have those AMC hyperproducing pseudomonas, it may actually be a a much better drug for pseudomonas as compared to ceftazidime by itself, perhaps increasing susceptibility by about ten percent. Um, or so, and so Avicaz um, is primarily being used for those two uh, indications in those hospitals where they have those specific pseudomonases that are susceptible to, um, or uh, for carbapenemase producing bacteria. Now, <clears throat> there was this patient that I mentioned earlier who came with two sepsis episodes of multidrug resistant pseudomonas and actually having uh, an ESBL producing um, E. coli uh, the, um, sepsis and was not treated earlier, Avicaz would have been a good empiric regimen for her because it would have treated her pseudomonas. And there are very, very few antibiotics that would have done that. Traditionally, we had to decide whether to go to pseudomonas side or the enteric bacteria, and it was kind of an educated guess, and you either get it or not. So I see Avicaz as being used for carbapenemase producers, sometimes ESBL producers, if you don't have alternatives. And I, I would echo that. I mean, at our institution, it's been our drug for our CRE. We you know, fortunately don't have the big CRE problem, but that's where we use it. And we try not to use it for our pseudomonas because we have other agents for MDR pseudomonas, such as uh, Zerbaxa CT, that I could pull to. So again, it's, it's one of those, both of them are important tools for pathogens that aren't usually prevalent right now. 
uh, in terms of, you know, as an empiric, re uh, empiric thing I'm contemplating. Uh, I'm doing it based on an individual level, but I'm trying not to overuse one or the other because I need both of them to sustain in my armamentarium. Yeah, and I think that, again, we beat this dead horse a lot today, but again, knowing your local epidemiology is huge. Um, you need to know what your XDR suits look like to those two drugs, because you, although if you look kind of globally, ceftolozane seems to be more potent, seems to be more active, and that makes sense from a mechanistic standpoint. If you happen to have a predominance of certain mechanisms of resistance at your institution, the flip can be true. Right. And, and so I think it's very important that institutions are aware what their pseudomonads look like to those two agents.